Hi, everybody. Uh, for those of you I don't know, I'm Joan Gable. I'm the dean of the Robert J. Trulask Senior College of Business, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today for our SRAM lecture in international business. Before we begin, usual routine, please turn off your cell phones and put them away. I'm, I'm watching you all to see you do that. Thank you. And please remember to stay through the Q&A. In fact, most of today's presentation is going to be Q&A, which I'll present to you in a minute. And I really encourage you to think about what you might want to know. So one of the strategic priorities of the True Last College of Business is to try to bring you real-time presentations from industry experts in the field. And we often bring you corporate leaders or private industry representatives because we really think our business partners play a very important role in giving you perspective and more stories and history. We're taking a slightly different tack today and bringing you someone from the Department of Commerce. And I'll let um, Mr. Bastian explain to you exactly what that agency does and what the function is, or I'll let you ask him about it if you're curious, because it, there's a lot more to it than many people realize. But the purpose in bringing in speakers like this, as you know, is to give you some opportunity to ask questions, access to people that you might not otherwise be able to see. And we're very fortunate to be able to do this particular international lecture as a result of the generosity of John Schramm. He's been an incredible supporter of our international activities here in the college, leveraging his own professional experience, 20 years working to expand the global footprint of companies like Sears and Levi Strauss. He then went on to form his own consulting firm, which is now based in San Francisco, and he has a multitude of prominent corporations. And today's lecture is, serves as a symbol of his dedication to enhance your international cognizance, acumen, cross-cultural competency, both on the campus and, and beyond as you take jobs here and abroad. So unfortunately, Mr. Schramm can't be here today, but I'm um, his proxy when I say how pleased we are to introduce our esteemed speaker, Mr. Walter A. Bastian. So Mr. Bastian is a graduate of Georgetown University with a Bachelor of Arts degree, and he went on to receive a master's degree from Creighton University. Following his education, he served as an intelligence officer in the Air Force and worked in the corporate trust department of a Washington bank. Once he joined the U.S. Department of Commerce, Mr. Bastian held a number of assignments related to Latin America, and in his current role as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Commerce, he's responsible for developing programs, policies, and strategies designed to strengthen the U.S. position in the Western Hemisphere. He is the distinguished recipient of numerous awards, the most recent of which, the Presidential Rank Award, was bestowed upon him for his exceptional service to the American people for an extended period of time and his commitment to excellence in public service. So, uh, you all hear me introduce speakers, you know, regularly, and many of you have heard me give similar speeches um, in anticipation of bringing in an expert to share their wisdom with you. But I have a slightly different um, story for you today because I've actually known Mr. Bastian personally since we were trying to remember exactly when, but we think it goes back to 2005, when I was um, a young professor on the faculty of Georgia State University in downtown Atlanta. Um, where I began my academic career, and I was teaching international business courses and had the very good fortune of sitting exactly where you are and being invited to hear Mr. Bastian speak about doing business in Latin America, the climate being quite different then, even than it is now in a short period of time. A lot has changed in this hemisphere, and I invite you to ask about that in just a moment. And after the presentation, I stood in line to ask a question, like some of you probably will, and I asked a question about some research I was doing on corporate social responsibility and business ethics in emerging economies. And long story short, that emerged into an association for me with the Department of Commerce's Good Governance Program in Central America that went on for several years and really was my entree, if you will, into Latin America. So those of you who um, will take one of our international courses was with the CLP trip to Chile or will be in the future, is going with Lauren Milbach on the School of Accountancy trip to Chile. Um, my previous students from my former life who traveled with me, all of that effort in trying to bring business education to our U.S. students into the Western Hemisphere further south than we are now, even further south in Florida, where I used to be, is attributable to this conversation and a presentation like today. So it really actually, without being too melodramatic, changed my life that day. That presentation we heard changed how I did all of my teaching, changed my research interests, and I think accelerated me in my career into you know the very fortunate position that I'm in now. So please join me in welcoming a very good friend and colleague, Mr. Walter Bastian. <laughs> Good 
Now, um, some of the MBA students have already had a chance to visit with uh, Mr. Bastian, but what I would like to do, or what he would like to do really, is um, something a little different than what we normally do, than rather than a really a formal speech. Um, he can give a little background, maybe on the agency itself, and on what it means to, to be in the position that he's in, and then he immediately wants to open it up to questions. He has tremendous expertise on the Western Hemisphere, obviously, and don't forget that goes north in addition to south and what that means, but also on the free trade agreements that we have here and in general. So um, I will, well, we'll just open it up to questions and we'll use the handheld mics as soon as he's done just with some introductory remarks. So thank you very much. Dean, thank you very much. It's nice to see some of you again. Huh? Like I tell you, in the last session, Mike asked all the questions. <laughs> you, you got your quota. So we're going to talk about trade. I, I tell you, I came in last night. I took the cab from the airport here. And, you know, it, it's a question that, you know, old guys always ask, you know, the cab driver, how's business? <clears throat> I asked that of everybody, how's business? And, and he said, oh, it's pretty good. I said, so how many people are there in Colombia? And he said, well... We just went over the 100,000 mark. And I said, that's pretty good. And I said, do you know anything about free trade agreements? And he said, oh, a little bit. He said he was a business student. And so I said, you getting any new business here? Any new investment here? And he said, well, we got White Castle and Krispy Kreme. Now, <laughs> I'm a big fan of Krispy Kreme. <laughs> and unfortunately, where I live in, the Washington area, there are no White Castles, but I buy them frozen, okay? Stick them in the microwave one minute, they taste just as good. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I will tell you just, uh, and, uh, and for those of you that were at the last session, I apologize, some of this could be a little repetitive, and I'll try to keep that to a minimum, but I do have to ask the question, no, you're not allowed to answer as you did the first time. Um, what is the department, what does the Department of Commerce do? I mean, okay, so if somebody said to you, you walked up to you in a supermarket and said, hey, I work for the Department of Commerce, what would you do besides turn around and think the person's kind of weird? Any ideas? Okay, Mike. I said promote commerce. Promote commerce. Well, see, now that's, that's, a, that's a good answer. And you also said before tariffs. You talked, okay, so... The Department of Commerce, by Washington standards, is a mid-sized government agency. That's about 45,000 employees. The commerce portion of that is about, excuse me, the part that deals with trade is about 3,000. So that leaves a few people out there, you know, looking for a job. And, but under our, our, under our roof, we have 12 bureaus. Trade is one. I said 3,000 out of, you know, that other number is, is, is pretty small percentage. What does the rest of the department do? And we've got a bunch of, that's a tip, bunch. We, we have a number of agencies under our roof, including the Census Bureau, ones that come around and count your nose every 10 years. Uh, but th they actually work, you know, between the 10-year periods and take all kinds, census of manufacturing, uh, a lot of different things that they look at uh, year in and year out. We have the National Institute of Standards and Technology, affectionately known as NIST. NIST is what used to be called the Bureau of Standards. So all the standards for the United States are all maintained uh, out in Gaithersburg, Maryland, but the headquarters for it is, is, is at, at the department itself. And it's kind of an interesting place. It's, uh, I think we've got three Nobel Prize winners in science uh, there. So they're a group of, you know, People that carry all their pencils sharpened in their top pocket, but they're really good at numbers and <laughs> equations and stuff like that. And I don't understand a thing they do. We have the Minority Business Development Agency. And as that would imply, that, that's trying to find business opportunities for uh, minority-owned businesses, both at home and abroad. We have the Economic Development Agency. The Economic Development Agency is really involved in community development throughout the United States principally, though once they get a taste of foreign travel, they say, why can't we take lessons learned here and go abroad? So we've been able to incorporate them in, in a lot of the work that we do. We also, 
the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. These are people that deal with frequency allocations. Um, we have uh, the part that I find the most fascinating, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And these, it includes the National Weather Service, the people that protect our marine resources, and these are coral reefs, barrier reefs, uh, monitor fishing populations and fishing practices around the world. Um, it, and it, they, they're also, it, it's a uniform service, which not many people realize. We have our small little navy of 20, I think it's 27, 26, 27 ships, depending what's in dry dock at the time. Um, that, are, that are research vessels. We have the, the, also some of the aircraft that fly inside of hurricanes. That's part of the weather service uh, that we've got. The, um, they also are first responders in the sense that when there's an earthquake in Haiti or a disaster in the Gulf, <coughs> particularly, well, in, in Haiti, they went in immediately to set up a weather service for the Haitians because they had none to begin with. Uh, we, we, uh, they set that up, and in the case of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, they had to go in and remap the seabed because there's so many miles, thousands of miles of pipeline on the Gulf floor to be sure that you know, nothing had cracked or ruptured and, and was going to cause some sort of a, uh, environmental disaster. So just to give you an idea, it's, it, it's uh, you know, so we have, sat they have their own satellite service and so forth. So it's, it, it, they're the people with all the neat toys. You know, and if you're a guy, you say, wow, airplanes, ships, and boats, and stuff like that. It's, 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 it's kind, of a, uh, kind of exciting. So what I try to do as part of my work is to how do I incorporate all of these fellows into trade, men and women into trade? You know, if you're working for the weather service, you say, what the hell, do, excuse me, why do I care about trade? You know, I mean, you know, that's not what I do for a living. If, if, if I'm working for the Institute of Standards and Technology, and I'm a Nobel Prize winner, why the heck do I care about trade? And what we're trying to do is to say, you, you men and women have some great talents out there that other countries could use, take advantage of, to improve their competitiveness. And that's what we're, we're, we're trying to do. A couple of things that I'm interested in. One is improving competitiveness of, of firms, uh, in, in my case, in, in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, to be able to compete with uh, in a global marketplace. We negotiate free trade agreements. If you don't have the tools at your disposal to be able to take advantage of these, you might as well, there would be no sense in whatsoever in, in, in negotiating um, these agreements. But, but so, how do I bring all these people into the fold? Um, how, how do I use NOAA and its uh, environmental capabilities? to improve the value of a free trade agreement. I don't know what anybody knows about a free trade agreement, but a free trade agreement is more than about trade. It, and I always tell people it's a misnomer, it's a business agreement. It, it's a document that has probably 1,200 pages to it, single-spaced, boring as hell to read, with about a 1,200-page annex. <clears throat> and it sets out the guidelines in a number of different areas that affect the conduct of business uh, between the United States and the country or countries that we're negotiating with. <clears throat> it's, got a labor, it's got labor provisions in there. It's got environmental provisions in there. So that's not what you normally think about when you think about a trade agreement. But you know, how, um, It's got fi uh, financial requirements. By requirements, I mean uh, actions that a country has to take to have a transparent financial system. It deals, obviously, with tariff invest, uh, uh, reductions, all aspects of investment, dispute settlement issues. It deals with intellectual property protection, labeling requirements, standards, so forth. It covers pretty much anything that you, that's going to affect you and your ability to conduct you as, as an American company, ability to conduct business abroad. A question that was asked after the last session was pretty much how do you pick a country with which you're going to negotiate? It's a pretty good question. The answer is we don't pick them. We have free trade agreements with 17 countries. In each case, the country has approached us and said, we'd like to negotiate a free trade agreement with you. And in fact, we have cases in, in, in this hemisphere, the Western Hemisphere, where we started a negotiation and it wasn't working. It wasn't going to really We didn't have the confidence that the country could undertake the, the commitments that, that it said it would. Uh, and we've broken off uh, trade negotiations with them. One was Ecuador. 
uh, when we were negotiating with the Colombians, we were going to negotiate with Ecuador also, and we just decided, no, it, it, it's not going to work for us. There are a lot of questions I asked about free trade agreements. You know, are they fair? Are they costing U.S. jobs? So forth. Let me just give you a couple of, of examples. I'm not going to bore you with a lot of numbers because you can come back with numbers of your own and question everything that I say. But I just want to give you an example of why some of these are particularly important to us. And I'm going to go uh, NAFTA. Maybe I'll just focus on that one. We have a 2,000-mile border with Mexico. The volume of trade that goes back and forth across that border on a minute basis is a half a million dollars a minute, every minute of the year. And that's pretty damn impressive. And with Canada, it's double that. It's about a million dollars a minute. So part of also that we're trying to do is through free trade agreements and other mechanisms is to guarantee that we can keep those particular, those two borders open. Our, our business community in the United States is in lockstep, for better or for worse, with the Canadians. I had mentioned earlier that I drive a GMC Yukon. Um, in the process of making that vehicle, it crosses the US-Canadian border seven times. So really, you can't tell what part of it's US or what part of it's Canadian. It's North American. It's a North American uh, vehicle. So when you have an event like a 9-11 and the border closes, you immediately feel the effect of that on the US economy. I mean, it, it's within a matter of hours. Because we close our border, well, there goes the auto industry that, de that depends, relies on, on Canadian import or, or partnership, <coughs> which is a good part of our um, <coughs> auto industry. <coughs> so the trick then for us is, how do we keep that border open in times of trouble here in the United States? And as I like to point out, the Secretary of Homeland Security is not paid to balance the trade account to keep the border open for trade. He paid to, or she's paid, rather, to uh, ensure that the nation is physically secure. By the same token, the Secretary of Commerce, the head of the US Trade Representative, they're not paid to ensure the integrity, the physical security of the United States. They're paid to generate more exports and more jobs for the United States. <clears throat> How do you win those two? And that's a pretty difficult thing to do because they're both extremely important. And I th the trick for the trade people is to be able to make a cogent argument that economic security is important. It's always been kind of an afterthought. Eh. You know, it's, it's uh, yeah, business is business, and they can take and business can take care of itself. It can't. It can't when you've got a framework that precludes their, be, their being able to operate freely. So uh, th that's part of what we're, we're trying to do. And, and uh, with other countries, I mean, we don't have a 2,000-mile border with Chile, last time I checked, or a 5,000-mile border with Costa Rica. But we have other interests in, in, in investments in those countries uh, that support uh, our economy as, as well as theirs. And, and we need to do everything we can to ensure that those operations run as fluidly um, as, as, as possible uh, and continue to work. So that, that's a real uh, challenge for us. Another challenge that we face in, on the trade side is uh, trying to overcome what's sometimes uh, the dislike for U.S. foreign policy. And th that's a tough one. I mean, you know, what, what are relations like with the Venezuelans? Well, they're not our best friends. Uh, what about the Bolivians? Probably not our best friends. Ecuadorans? Probably not our best friends. Nicaraguans? Probably not our best friends. <clears throat> but to try to get countries to understand that you might, it, if you're a democracy, it's fine not to like U.S. foreign policy. But when you get annoyed with it, if you're really pissed off, don't take it out on the companies that are operating, U.S. companies that are operating in your country, that are creating jobs there and contributing to your economic growth. That's the wrong target. You know, so what, what happens invariably? You know, I'd like to have about $100 for every time McDonald's has had a window broken. You know, because somebody gets mad at, at, you know, and it ain't the quality of the hamburger, you know, but gets mad at U.S. foreign policy and decides to take it out on a U.S. corporation or burns a U.S. owned gas station or, or a manufacturing facility in a foreign country. Those don't make sense. And, and it really doesn't, I can guarantee, it doesn't change. 
uh, our view on foreign policy towards a foreign country or, or alter our, our, our policy towards a third country. You know, we don't care that, we care that it's a U.S. asset that, that's being targeted and abused, but it, it has no bearing whatsoever on, on, on what, we're, what we're thinking uh, on a foreign policy side. So that, that's a major concern. Another major concern that I've got is uh, with a free trade agreement, with free trade agreements, is uh, making them work and getting the public to understand what the value is in a free trade agreement. It's, uh, uh, I've spent a lot of time uh, over the last few years, but particularly with the most difficult of all of our agreements to get through, well, excuse me, second most difficult, which was CAFTA. And all I can say is we do a miserable job at messaging, at being able to talk about the good that these agreements bring. And I don't know how to put it any other way except to say we really suck at it. You know, we're just not good at it. We've got a, we've got a really good story uh, to tell, but we're hesitant to go out across the country and talk about the advantages of a free trade agreement. It's kind of interesting, and I understand that the chairman of Caterpillar was out here recently, and probably said, made the same observation, but we currently have free trade agreements with 17 countries, and with those 17 countries, we run a trade surplus, so we don't have the deficit. So our deficit, ten, not tends to be, is with countries as a group with which we don't have a free trade agreement, where we can get the rules clear. We don't have hang-ups at customs, and we don't have transparency issues, and we don't have dispute settlement issues when there's a problem. We do damn well. Um, and uh, on balance, the agreements have, in fact, created jobs in the United States. A, a real concern has been, well, okay, that may be true, but what, what's happened with Mexico as an example? Aren't they worse off today than they were before? Well, at every Mexican government statistic that I've seen shows no. In fact, the growth in Mexico under the free trade agreement has not been uniform throughout the country. It's benefited the northern part of the country much more than it has the southern part of the country. But on balance, it's, done, uh, it's, it's been positive for Mexico. It's certainly been positive for Chile, uh, for Central America, in spite of the fact that the Central American economies are so tied to ours by geography, by, by culture, by a number of things, that when we suffer, when we have a tough time here, they got a tougher, tougher time down there. But regardless, the overall, overall there's been a, a, a huge uh, benefit in, in job creation and in you know, the economic growth in, in, uh, in that region. So it's a good story to tell, but it's one that we're, we're hesitant to talk about. Um, and not everybody is receptive to the message. It was an example I used earlier. In the run-up to uh, the vote on Columbia, I was up on Capitol Hill about three weeks ago talking to a congressman, and he said, well, I voted against the Central America Free Trade Agreement, and I'm going to vote against Colombia. And as I've noted early on in my career, you, you, you don't win by arguing with a member of Congress. I mean, that's like kiss of death. <clears throat> so, but you, you say, well, why is that? You know, I'm kind of perplexed. You've got a major port in your district. The longshoremen support it. They think it's a good thing. He said, yep, but I got textile people, apparel people in, in my district. Now, the short answer is, for all intents and purposes, Columbia produces no apparel. They import it. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a hollow argument. Your constituents may think that there's a problem on this, but, you know, maybe you need to go out and educate your constituents. I didn't say that. I wanted to keep my job. <coughs> But you know, as you walk away, and the best I can hope for in that case is just not to annoy him or alienate him, but just to listen carefully and hope that he doesn't become very vocal in his opposition to the agreement. But we've got a lot of that. The, it's interesting that NAFTA uh, was approved by Congress like 15 years ago by one vote by the Senate, or excuse me, by the House of Representatives, by one vote. And then like 10, 12 years later, you have CAFTA coming through, and it's approved by two votes. So you can say, damn, that's 100% improvement. <laughs> or you can say, damn, you know, in 10, 12 years, we picked up one vote. You know, you, it, it, how do you want to look at it? The truth of the matter is that the issue of trade is still a very sensitive issue in the United States. 
And I think it's one that, that's not particularly uh, well understood. And I think in large measure because we, those of us who deal with this every day, are not as vocal as the chairman of Caterpillar is. And we don't want to alienate people. And we have a lot of constituencies out there that we have to answer to, not the least of which is Congress, uh, and some very sensitive industry groups in, in the United States. So I'll leave you, just one other thing I'd like to cover that I didn't cover earlier. Um, is this, somebody came up to me and said, you know, how do you choose the, the, the country that you want to negotiate with? And the answer is we don't choose, they choose us. <clears throat> well, how do you ensure that the U.S. business community is well served by what you're negotiating. I mean, you know, I'll tell you, and that's a really fair question, because I'm a government employee, I don't run a business. My father was a government employee, my grandfather was, and my great-grandfather was. So, you know, nobody's ever earned honest money in our lives. So it's pretty tough to, to uh, it's a good question. But we have a pretty elaborate system. So a, com a country comes and says, we want to negotiate with you. We have a group of, of uh, Trade advisory committees, we've got about 20 or 22 of these committees. And, you know, you've got one on steel, you've got one on aviation, you've got another one on transportation separate from aviation, ag. Uh, there are 20 some of these, and we have our own. Department of Agriculture has its uh, own. And before we sit down to negotiate, we say, look, they've come to us, they want to negotiate an agreement. <clears throat> what do you think should be in it? Do you think there's going to be any value in this to you? And if the answer is, yeah, there'll be some value in this to us, if you do A, B, C. So we sit down for the first of what are going to be countless rounds of negotiations. And you stake out your position. We're going to want this, 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 and this. After each round, we go back to our industry advisors and say, in your area, this is what's come up. And in some areas are very broad. You know, if it's customs reform, well, that affects virtually everybody. But, you know, on... on the issues of steel or agriculture or apparel, uh, it, we go back to, to them and say, okay, you know, and if they say, now this isn't really good enough. Or, you know, then we go back for the next round and try to get that resolved. If they say, yeah, this is just what we want, that's, that's a good thing. And we can have, I mean, keep in mind, you come up with a 1,200 page doc, basic document, it's a lot of negotiations. A 1,200 page roughly tariff appendix to this or annex. That's going through the entire Customs Code of the United States, which has to be the most boring job on the face of the earth, line by line, and coming up with tariff reductions. Do I do it right away? Do I do it in five years? Do I do it in 10 years? How do I stage this thing? God, it's awful work. It's what you never want to have to do. Um, anyway, so we, we go back to the companies, and you know, you end up with this 1,200-page document with a 1,200-page annex at the end, and we say, okay, here's the final product. What do you think? The point I mentioned in this is this isn't a group of government hacks going out and determining what it is you want or your companies want. This is the government trying to establish a framework that you can live with, that you're comfortable with, that you think is going to benefit you, <clears throat> and that the companies can operate within. So it sets up the 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 guidelines and the rules and regulations. So I just wanted you to know, that I wanted to convey that idea that this isn't something we do just shooting in the dark and thinking that we're smarter than the business community because clearly we're not. Um, but, but there is a role for government in this. You know, we, we are the, we will negotiate, which is what governments do one with another, and that's, that's our function, and to establish a framework or, uh, with which, within which the companies can operate. So now that I've probably bored you to death, on this, um, and before you go out and read the tariff schedule, uh, give me some questions that I, you know, I can address, and, and to try to start a dialogue. Or yeah, back a couple back here. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned uh, the ability to compete earlier, and I was wondering with the increasing number of free trade agreements, how you see the long-term viability of private sector labor unions? I'm, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. I was wondering um, how you see the long-term viability of private sector labor unions. You know, you mentioned being able to compete earlier, and I was just wondering how you see that with the private number sector. of private sector labor unions. Uh, oh, and labor unions. Yeah. That's a really interesting uh, 
question. As I said, labor provisions are, are, are in, in the agreement. <clears throat> the, when the member of Congress mentioned to me that we needed stronger labor provisions in the agreement, and I said, well, the Central America Agreement, which was already in play, has very strong labor provisions in there. And it's not only got provisions, but it's got penalties for violating those provisions. And in fact, we can fine foreign governments for failure to adhere to, or their companies adhering to these provisions. I thought that was a pretty good answer. And he came back and he said, so where does that money go? And I said, well, it goes back. We use that money to train the violators to ensure that these things don't happen again. It seems a pretty reasonable thing to do with the money. Well, that wasn't good enough because he thought the money should come back to members in his district. OK, that's not what I'm going to win by any, you know. That, that, but we do have, uh, we make a point out of, and we've learned this lesson probably the hard way, of reaching out to uh, labor, to civil society as a whole. We reach out you know, to, all the, to the NGOs, uh, everybody that we can think of to uh, let them know what it is we're doing. Our meetings are transparent. You know, the negotiations are not open. The negotiations are government to government. But the results of those negotiations clearly are, are things that we're, uh, that we're making public. And, and that includes the labor and environment, which is the other uh, really testy area. So I don't know if that answers your question, but, but we do in, engage them uh, from the beginning. And keeping in mind, there's some people you'd, you'd never win over. Um, you know, somebody may, even for those countries with which you'd think there'd be virtually no opposition, Chile. I mean, there were still people opposed to having a free trade agreement with Chile. Not based on what Chile is today, but what Chile had been in the past. The story, uh, you know, the, the um, Colombia spent all this time trying to answer questions about the, or defending the changes that have been made in Colombia. Well, yeah, they murder people. You know, Harrison Ford got shot up how many times? You know, with the bad guys running along the roofs in, in, in Colombia. That's not the Colombia of today. And you know, the fact is that even through its worst times, the Colombian government, whether it was you know, right or centrist. Uh, was probably the strongest ally we've had in, in, in Latin America. So, and, and that was a good thing. They have done everything that we've asked of them to do on, on in virtually every area, in foreign policy, on trade. I mean, I can't tell you how many times, because I don't know, how many times we went back to them and said, OK, yep, yeah, we've concluded this agreement with you. We're ready to go, but we want you to do something else. And, OK, we'll do something else. Well, no, now, we, now we want you to do something else. We kept going back and back and back to them. And every time they, they accommodated what we wanted. Nonetheless, there was still a sizable number of uh, people that, that voted against the agreement. You know, I said, well, they, they kill people. Medellin's the you know, murder capital of the world. No, it's not. It's not even close anymore. You know, places like Barranquilla, extremely dangerous. No, not anymore. You know, it, uh, it's images. And again, it goes back to that whole issue of messaging. We've done a really poor job of, of talking about the changes that have been made and, and what's happened to society as a whole in these countries. More than you wanted to know. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, Department of Commerce does a poor job uh, marketing them, themselves and the benefits of all the free trade agreements. And uh, I think changing the public's perception of it is very difficult. But what steps do you think you could take to, uh, to get to educating the public about the benefits of the free trade? Okay. My own view is that we are hesitant to go out and make a really big deal about this, of, of engaging those that are opposed to uh, the agreements. You know, it's like, well, this congressman or this district or, or this state is totally opposed to, to free trade. Well, let's go out and talk to the folks. You know, I mean, I don't think you do anything or you gain much by sitting in your office back in Washington and, and saying, ooh, well, I don't want to go out there and get beat up. You know, I don't want the Des Moines Register taking me to task. I'm just making this up, or the Omaha World Herald or something. You know, or we, we need to be out there. I, uh, I'll tell you a story that really brought this home to me. Lou Dobbs, when he used to have his uh, 
show on on CNN. I, was, I used to listen to him, even though I didn't agree with anything he said. But in the evening, because after a long day at work, you know, well, I have XM radio, so I tune in CNN, and you want to hear somebody that, that kind of gets on your nerves and get the blood flowing and wake you up before you hit rush hour traffic, or you listen to Lou Dobbs. And, and so one night, I'm, you know, I'm still in the parking lot, and I turn it on, and Lou Dobbs says, well, the subject tonight is going to be CAFTA and NAFTA. And with me tonight is <clears throat> Dean Gable, <laughs> uh, representing organized labor. And so, well, Dean, what can you tell me about <clears throat> NAFTA? Well, Lou, it's been an abject failure. Now he's got my attention. That blood's starting to go again. And then he says, so what can you tell me about CAFTA? Well, Lou, it's going to be an abject failure, too. At that point, they cut the commercial break. And when we came back, the labor person was gone. We were on another subject. So you're left with all you've heard twice now, you know, in the period of about 15 seconds, is abject failure, abject failure. We don't take that on. You know, who, do you want to go out and debate Lou Dobbs? Do you want to go out and meet the editorial boards of newspapers and maybe in districts that are hostile? Uh, it's not just ambivalent, but hostile to you. And I think we need to do that. I, I think if we've got a good product or service to sell, you know, you know whether it's Caterpillar, you know, earth movers or, or a free trade agreement, that's what you go out and do. Um, and the idea that you may get bruised a bit, the, the trick is, I think, is to at least listen to people, let them know that you're taking their concerns into account, as opposed to kind of turning your back on people and say, well, I'm not going to win that one, so why, why bother trying? Sometimes it's not just about winning, but it's, it's trying to mitigate the, the, the level of, of dissatisfaction with, with, with the service or product that you've got. We need to do a better job of that. We don't use social media very well. There are a lot of things we don't do very well. But we're the government. You know, it's, it's, not, our, it's not our strong suit. You know, we're, we're not um, you know, Procter and & Gamble. And, and it's kind of interesting, because I, I had a meeting with a number of folks from major US corporations that rely heavily on advertising. And said, can you, you know, you can sell soap, and you can sell cars, and this one can do that. Help me out. Oh, yeah, yeah, we will, we will. And, it, you know, the meeting's over, and that's the last you hear from them. So it's kind of, we, we need some help that way. OK, over here. I read, sorry. <laughs> I uh, read an article in Bloomberg maybe four or five months ago about the Department of Defense putting together a team of people that were trying to encourage business in uh, Iraq, I think it was, as part of the rebuilding effort. Do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> well, I don't think I'm going to talk too much about the Department of Defense, but I, I will tell you that when we, we have in Washington, chaired by the Secretary of Commerce, is something called the Trade Promotion Coordinating Committee. It's comprised of 19 agencies within the federal government, each that has something to do with trade. And the Defense Department is, is, is a major part uh, in that. The, the Defense Department, is, I'm not going to get in, into a conversation about the contracts that, that, they, uh, that they let. Uh, you know, that's, that's their own business. I can talk about mine. But um, I can also tell you that we were trying to do everything we can, both in Iraq and in Afghanistan to see what we can do to help to, uh, strengthen uh, the economies in those countries. But if, if, I'm not sure in that report what aspect of defense contracting they were talking about. If they were just talking about business in general, or if or they were. Well, I can, I can tell you from personal experience that I have a really excellent relationship with something called Southcom. Southcom stands for Southern Command. It's headquartered in, in Miami, <coughs> right out by the airport. And uh, this is a combatant command that has responsibility for uh, everything south of Mexico. Uh, Mexico is part of Northcom. Um, and the, uh, General Fraser uh, and his predecessors have given a lot of thought to what it, the role is between the private sector and the Defense Department. And th they come at it from the point of view of, 
they're clearly a first responder in any disaster. They want to do what they do best, which is get in, stabilize things, and get out. And they don't want, <clears throat> they don't want to have to be in the business of nation building in that sense, or, or building the economy in a country. And over the years, they found themselves involved in that to a degree more than they really wanted to do. So they've got a, it, it's almost like a coalition that they put together of agencies in the federal government that are actually embedded in Southcom to uh, assist in the, uh, or, or to be able to take over when the Defense Department has, has, has done what it's done. So it, it's a, um, and General Frazier has been really vocal in his uh, approach and his predecessor's approach uh, being copied by other com uh, combatant commands uh, globally. It, it, it works uh, pretty well. And I'll tell you an interesting thing about Southcom. When I talked about the fact that our relationships with some of these foreign governments aren't that hot, <clears throat> it's kind of interesting that in Nicaragua, the best, I think, the best government-to-government -government relationship we have is our military to theirs. <clears throat> we, we hold joint maneuvers with them. They're very helpful to us on, in, on our counter-narcotics efforts and in our efforts at, at stopping trafficking in, in persons. And uh, they're very professional. And it's, it, it's almost like there's a code among military folks. You know, you all go through the same kind of training and the same challenges. And it just it works out really well. So Nicaragua is a case where we try to build off of what they've done. And I'll give you an example of how that works. It's a long answer to a short question, but that's OK. Um, They gave me a contact with a guy by the name of Alvaro Baltadano. Alvaro Baltadano was a, he's a retired Sandinista general. So he was like our enemy, you know, and he was up in the hills with Ortega and shooting at, at you know, what they considered the bad guys. We considered them the good guys. But anyway, to, th through Southcom, we established a friendship with him. Today, he is, the retired general, is the head of their investment promotion. Uh, gov the government agency in charge of an, in trade and investment promotion. And he's been an in incredible ally. But I, don't, I couldn't have done that if I'd had to rely on straight, uh, normal government-to-government -government contact. And it was just the fact that he had a very good relationship with some military folks on the US side who opened the door for me. And he's turned out to not only be a good friend, but help me resolve about every trade issue that I've had with the Nicaraguans, with the Nicaraguan government. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a It's really quick. The Chilean agreement took 12 years. <laughs> well, in the great scheme of time, what's 12 years, you know? Um, the NAFTA took a long time also, because they had to wait for uh, Mexico to accede to the, to the uh, WTO, or the GATT at that time. Um, and so that stopped negotiations. Negotiations were, were stopped with Chile for, for a variety of reasons. So, um, and I'm trying to think, Central America Agreement probably took, it was less time, probably five or six years all in total. And there you, we were negotiating with six other countries, so that became very difficult. And we could conclude and implement with one country before, you know, any of the others. So Salvador was the first one that we completed the agreement with, where they complied with everything they had to do. And the, it's very interesting that the first country in Central America that approached us was Costa Rica saying we want a free trade agreement. We said, well, why don't you, if we're going to do it, let's do it for the whole region. They were the first ones to approach us, and they were the last ones to implement it. So uh, they had a lot of work they needed to do and, and uh, commitments that they promised to take up, which they hadn't. We do require that any commitment that a foreign government makes uh, be in law. So this, frequent, this is going to involve a lot of changes to constitutions because a lot of things are purview of the state or this you know, certain regulatory agency. 
And they say, yeah, we'll change that. No, no, you will change it, but you'll change it before this agreement goes into force. So anyway, the answer to your question, it, takes a, it generally takes a fair amount of time to do it. And because the rounds of negotiations, if you hold them every three or four months and you're going to hold 15, 20 rounds of negotiations, and you figure you've got holidays, this and that thrown in, it takes a long time to make a whole career out of it. So we've touched on the issue of communicating the value of free trade agreements to the American public. So I guess kind of what I'm wondering are your thoughts on why corporations that would benefit from free trade agreements haven't done a lot to communicate that to their consumers. Um, okay, I, I would. I think corporations may have done a better job than the government's done. Honestly, I, I think. Uh, if you, you know, I look at the Washington Post, and besides the sports page, I take a look at the uh, at the ads that are in there. And when you get close to a vote on something, it is it, the, the Caterpillars, the Boeing's, the Conagras that are in there with ads about why this is important, why this is important to their ninety thousand employees, so forth, so on. What it's going to mean to job creation. I think, and, and clearly. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which sometimes is not a great friend of, the, of an administration, sometimes there's some differences of, of, of opinion there, uh, has been a huge advocate uh, for this agreement. And their associate chambers, and these are things like the U.S.-Chile Chamber of Commerce or the U.S.-Dominican Republic Chamber of Commerce or whatever, U.S. fill in the name of the country. Uh, they, they meet in Washington once a year, and they spend you know, a day or two up on the hill knocking on doors, uh, talking to members of Congress about the value of any, whatever free trade agreement happens to be on the table at, at, at the time. I think what happens in that, in part, is that the members of Congress expect these people to knock on their door. And um, companies that are already doing business internationally have a voice. There's a different message sometimes that comes out from, and legitimately so, from companies that, are, that maybe are just domestically focused and are worried about uh, having to close a plant uh, here in the United States. So it's, uh, and, and those tend to pull at the heartstrings, I think, maybe a little more and, and get the attention of, of members of Congress. But we, on balance, we have a really good message to tell on balance these agreements not only create new jobs, but they keep a lot of jobs here in the United States. Uh, and, uh, but I, I think the private sector does a, 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 a good job. I, uh, you know, as much as you can be proud of a big company, I'm proud of some of these corporations. I think they do a good job. They put a lot of time and effort into it. Walter, I have a question for you. Am yes, I allowed to ask a question? <laughs> Um, I'm looking around the room, and I see freshmen in here who, who might have turned 19, and all the way up through graduate students who would be a little older than that. So they're facing completion of their educations and entering the workforce, but at very different phases in life. And many of them, I know, aspire to a career that would involve an international element of some kind. From your point of view, um, as an advocate of U.S. interests abroad and for what your agency does, what would you want them to know about what's going on in the Western Hemisphere, what the opportunities are for them, where they might focus their attention? Well, I, I, clearly, the focus today is on the Far East. Well, also in Europe, but for different reasons. But, but, but the concern uh, on, on China and other, and other countries in that region, I think it's for us, I do. Since 40% of, of U.S. exports go to the Western Hemisphere, I think that's a pretty good message in and of itself. And for all the changes that have occurred and the focus on uh, the Far East and so forth, that, change, that percentage hasn't changed. That's a very solid market for us. And I think it's one that with the advent of these free trade agreements and the opening up of these markets uh, has, will go up even further. I am very hopeful. Uh, that our relationship with Brazil will strengthen significantly. Uh, we found um, uh, with President <coughs> Rousseff the, the ability, we, we've got somebody there that we can deal with. We've dealt with her previously 
uh, in, on a, with, with a commercial hat that she was wearing, a, a trade hat. Um, I think she's really well versed. She understands the value of the relationship with the United States. I think the Brazilians are, have come to the conclusion, I don't know if they would necessarily say it publicly, but that f for this increase in trade and business with China, they don't get much out of it. They don't get the fixed investment necessarily that they want. They've they got buyers for the commodities, but it's all extractive. And so what comes back to make me more competitive globally? Yeah, you know, maybe it, well, and, and that's the issue. And they've said now on more than one occasion that they need to reevaluate that relationship as opposed to the ones that they get from the US and, and Europeans and others that have a real um, tech transfer uh, part to it. So they can actually do something to increase uh, their competitiveness. So I, I, I think, so I, you've got that. I think our, our relation, I think the Colombia agreement will, will play uh, very, very well for us. But Brazil's the big one. Um, and we're not ready to sit down and I don't think and negotiate a free trade agreement with them. But we are negotiating on a number of different fronts. A free sky, or open skies agreement with them. We're working on some treasury issues with them. We've worked on some visa issues with them. And visa isn't just permission for you to go take a vacation in Rio. But this is the ability of corporations to be able to get US workforce into Brazil to work on a project or on a maintenance of a, of a product. This has always been a, an obstacle for US companies. And we're to the point now that, that we can uh, overcome that with them. And we found partnership in a number of, of areas, uh, working with each other on, on science and, and issues, and, I mean, space issues and things of that nature. Uh, it's been very, very uh, productive. And I keep saying it's important, keeping in mind that if you look at all of South America, Brazil is a country, roughly 20, I think it's 26 states in Brazil, and the state of Sao Paulo alone is 40% of the GDP of South America, to give you an idea of size and importance of, of, a, uh, of, of one province or state within the country. So anyway, I'm pretty optimistic, and if we can get the Argentines to uh, be a little more reasonable, uh, the, the idea of closing the, their borders, or, excuse me, uh, it's probably too strong. Imports of products into, for 600 and some products into Argentina. A company can import it, but it's got to export the like amount. So there is no free trade in that regard. It's, it's controlled. And as bad as this might be for US exporters, it's equally bad for Argentine exporters who can't get the inputs that they need to manufacture a product for export. So it's kind of a really short-sighted um, government program, but <clears throat> they're kind of known for that. Yes? OK, there we go. Um, playing off the dean's question, as a student or someone who's going to be maybe starting a business, would this help us to be able to start small businesses overseas or say get hired by a business overseas more easily in the countries that have free trade agreements rather than someone we don't have a free trade agreement with? Okay, the answer is yes. But, but let but me... how, I mean... Sorry. Okay, next question. No, um, <laughs> I, I think what you want to take a look at... Um, I. First, if what most countries or companies do is they look at Canada. Canada has the advantage that for a good part of the country they speak English anyway. Uh, maybe your French is good, I don't know. But you can follow that transaction. You know, for most, you can walk it across the border if you're selling them something, right? I mean, it, it's, the barriers are minimum, the language is the same, the time zones are basically the same. It's an ease of doing business to get comfortable with the idea of. I don't consider Canada going abroad. Any Canadians here? OK. Because you kind of look at it like the largest state in the union. You know, it's the 51st, and it's huge. I mean, it, it, it's so similar to us. And the relationship that we've got is phenomenal. And things that we never hear about. But, and again, I'll, let me just go back to 9-11 for a second. When our planes couldn't land in the United States, they landed in Canada. 
and the Canadians took the passengers in. I mean, families took them in. When there's uh, an ice storm in Canada, it's our public utilities that are going across the border to take care of them. I'll, I'll tell you a Katrina story. This is one that really, to me, showed the value of this relationship and why it's a good neighbor and a good place for you to do business. Um, I got a phone call from a congressman from Pittsburgh who said, I need help. <laughs> largest producer of liquid hydrogen in the United States was, the largest facility was in New Orleans. It's down. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so is it important, I ask? Because I said I have no business savvy at all. He said, well, it's used in lab research, it's used in this set, and by the way, it also fuels the space shuttle. Okay, well, maybe it is important. But it was the Canadians who had a plant that was going down for maintenance, had gone down for maintenance, and they brought it back up just to be able to produce what we needed to meet our needs. That's a pretty remarkable uh, business relationship that, that we've got with that country. So anyway, that's the one that I would focus on, number one. And if you want a challenge, after you've made your first million, um, I think you keep it, for a small business, you keep it within the hemisphere. And that's when I would take a look at, at somebody that's got a free trade agreement. My colleagues all say, well, do Canada first, Mexico number two. Depending on what the product is or the service is, I'm not sure that I would necessarily take Mexico's number two, but maybe a Costa Rica uh, or a Colombia once we have the agreement act. We've concluded the agreement. They have a lot of work to do yet to clean up some uh, congressional issues they need to do. But I think those are the places that I would take a look at. Again, it's kind of a hard question to answer without knowing what the product or service is, but I'm sure you'd do well at whatever you pick. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. You, you touched on briefly in the small group section with the MBA. Uh, students, the, the role of education and increasing educational standards in some of these countries to help these free trade agreements really take off. Could you expand on that a little bit more? Yeah, okay. Again, not to put too fine a point on it, the education system in Latin America sucks. Okay, so we'll start from that. What does that mean? That means that, yeah, you know, they've got a university, they all have university systems, and as I've said at nauseum today, they produce a lot of poets and historians and social scientists, economists, but nothing that puts a man or a woman on the moon, nothing that's going to foster <clears throat> innovation, creativity. So th the whole system stinks, I think. The, I'll give you an example of, about this, and this had nothing to do with the free trade agreement. I think I mentioned it at, at the last session. But there was a, I was at a meeting in, New Orleans, in, in Miami on Haiti, and there was this jackass in the audience. We were talking about education. He stood up and he said, well, nothing wrong with our education system. We just need more PhDs. And you say, well, let's see. You've got no public school system in the country. Um, you know, most people can't afford private schools. How do you build a pipeline to, you know, starting in first grade through high school, through a four-year university, up to, you know, master's and up, up to a PhD program? How do you do it? You have no pipeline. So it's interesting, in, in a couple of years ago, a survey I saw done by Financial Times for Latin America, they, they listed the top 200 universities in the world, and Latin America had one. OK, well, yeah, you're not doing much uh, at, at that point. The idea of that works well in the United States, junior, a junior college system, doesn't exist in Latin America. In Latin America, there's one junior college that's based on a US model. So you go two years, and you can transfer your credits to a four-year school. There's one. And it's a joint venture with LaGuardia Community College in New York, and it's in, uh, with Universidad Central in Santiago, Chile. It's the only one. They have a couple two-year vocational schools, but it's not the same thing. Credits don't transfer. So that's it. The idea that, uh, well, there are over 200 foreign universities operating in China that can offer a degree from the foreign institution. So it could be Harvard University, Shanghai campus, making one up, OK? Or University of Missouri, Shanghai campus. There are 60, almost 70 in India. There's zero in Latin America. 
in large measure because higher education is the purview of the state, and they're the ones that can offer the diploma. That's kind of stupid. You know, so what's the alternative? Is that you know, these men and women, are, are boys and girls, are coming up to the states, and they're going to Georgia Tech, or they're going to University of Missouri, and at the end of the day, they stay here. That doesn't do anybody you know, much good. So we have a lot of work to do, uh, but middle school, high school, um, the, the system is really, uh, and, and there's some exceptions to it. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do, put a lot of time into, which has nothing to do really with commerce on the face of it, is to establish new programs for uh, schools in Latin America that take advantage of certain things. Um, one of these is uh, Nick, well, uh, in, in Uruguay taking advantage of the one computer per child, the only country that's implemented one in the whole hemisphere that's implemented that. And, and giving them, we went to the University of Nebraska to give them the, develop this, this, the software to put on these computers that got some business aspect to it. And that's worked out pretty well. And then we went in Nicaragua where they're doing it. Uh, we went to, um, I went to National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration and asked them to, uh, one of these computers bookmarked them with special programs. So not just the students who had these computers, but their parents could have access to them in value. So they could get the weather forecast and know when to plant, when to harvest, uh, what the world market prices were for commodities that they were growing. So and I, I view that as, as, as part of the educational system. I'm trying to also got a program to hook up some school, public school districts in the US with school districts, and this is at the high school level uh, throughout the hemisphere. But the truth is, not everybody wants it. You know, ed education, you know, you think is a beautiful thing, but some people view it a bit as a threat or, or it's not a great thing. You, you know, do you really want a well-educated uh, population? Well, I think clearly, you know, a country like Uruguay certainly does, 97% literacy rate, and I think uh, everybody's got, on average, 15.6 uh, years of education. So that's, you know, that's not bad. That, that's almost everybody, you know, that wants it having it, his or her college degree, undergraduate degree. But that's, those are really the exceptions. Uh, the, the rate of academic achievement in Latin America, excuse me, in South America, uh, it, ranked by continents, is the worst rate of achievement and growth in the world. So they're behind every other continent. As I said at lunch today, except Antarctica, but who's counting? Um, that's a pretty lousy track record for something that's as close to the United States with, with a school system, broad school system broadly defined, that's willing to partner with them. You know, but as I said, you know, a lot of them will come up here and then they stay, they stay here, as opposed to uh, you know, going back home. And part of that is also because they incur huge financial obligations up here uh, that are tough to meet when you go back and have to work on a local salary. Okay, so there's class in here at five o'clock, so. <laughs> I'm going to cut it off. So why don't we offer Mr. Bastian our thanks. Thank you, dear. Oh. We also have a plaque to present that reads, in appreciation to Walter Bastian, who served as this year's John A. Schramm Lecture in International Business. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>